Well, hello and welcome to this lecture. As you've probably already guessed, this is lecture number four in the Certificate of Professional Practice in the Epidemiology and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. Now, as always, I want to take a moment to thank those who have made this lecture series possible, including the Pacific Island Health Officers Association, the University of Arizona Zuckerman College of Public Health, the College of Micronesia Public Health Training Program, and of course, my home institution, the Fiji National University School of Public Health and Primary Care. Now, without the backing of these institutions, then these lectures could not be provided. And of course, I want to thank you, the participant, for your dedication and improving yourself no matter what area of practice you're in across the Pacific and beyond. And I also want to take a moment to thank the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from whom these lectures have been adapted. And I do want to point out that the opinions I express herein are my own and do not necessarily represent those of the CDC, PHOA, FNU, or COMFSM. Now, thus far in this lecture series, we've talked about an introduction to what epidemiology is, and it's important to NCDs. We've reviewed the burden of NCDs in the Pacific with an emphasis on related risk factors, and of course, the need for risk factor surveillance. And then last month, we covered the burden of disease, including basic epidemiological measures such as incidence, prevalence, uh, disability, adjusted life years, and so on and so forth. So this month, we'll be talking about descriptive and analytical studies, both of which are key methods by which we can gather epidemiological data on NCDs as well as their underlying risk factors, associated socioeconomic mediators, and so forth. In other words, this is an important lecture for anyone who's charged with gathering data on disease rates, as well as anyone who must work with and interpret data from such studies. So let's go ahead and jump right in and get started. Now at the conclusion of this lecture, you, the student, should be able to do the following. First, when presented with a specific NCD problem, such as determining the risk factors for obesity in a population of school-aged children, you should be able to identify what study type you would use, second, what method you would use to sample the population, or in other words, choose participants for your study, third, what measures of association you will use, or what statistical tests you will use to show the association between the risk factors and obesity in your population. And fourth and finally, you need to be able to interpret the results of your study. Now, if you can do these things and you're ready to use epidemiological studies to look closer at the NCD problems that you are facing in your jurisdiction and in the populations that you serve. So let's start with the simple question, why do we conduct studies? Now remember that this is the key factor of epidemiology, that it allows us to learn specifics about the problems in the populations we serve and to assign numeric values of the impact of these problems, and thus we're able to make better decisions. Now once we've described the problem and what risk factors contribute to the problem, then we can design interventions to address these problems. We can also use epidemiology epidemiological studies to determine the effectiveness of our interventions. Epidemiology truly is the science behind public health. Now, as you may recall from our previous discussions, it is in essence a tool for evidence-based practice and decision-making that ensures we make the best use of our limited resources. Without good epidemiological data derived from studies, then we are just guessing at what the problem is and what we should do about it. Now here we see a list of the different types of epidemiological studies. You will notice that we break them down into descriptive types and analytical types. Each of these is further broken down. Many of these terms you may have seen or heard before but do not understand what they mean. That is part of this lecture, to introduce you to the study types, what they mean, and when they are most appropriate, and hence allow you to choose what type you would use given a specific situation. Let's start with some basic differences between descriptive and analytical study designs. Descriptive studies are used to describe an event in the population, and we describe it by the variables of person, place, and time. Remember, that's descriptive epidemiology that we've talked about in the past. 
Now it's used to answer what, who, where, and when. But notice it doesn't answer why and how. That'll be analytical studies that we'll talk about in a minute. Now once we have this information and begin to analyze it, we can generate hypotheses about why a disease is happening in a specific population, why a specific group has greater risk factors, and so on and so forth. These hypotheses are essentially educated guesses about something that is happening in a population which we have observed through descriptive studies. Now surveillance data that you're most likely gathering as a routine part of your work in your particular jurisdiction, and hopefully this is going to be risk factor surveillance data in the case of NCDs, can be used to conduct descriptive studies. So for example, if descriptive data shows us that children coming from homes living below the poverty line have greater rates of obesity than those with higher incomes, what hypothesis could you generate from this? Perhaps you suspect that it is because children from these homes have lower levels of health literacy among their caregivers and thus do not understand the need for a balanced and a healthy diet. Or you may hypothesize that children from these homes lack the economic resources to eat a balanced diet. Either way, you have used the existing descriptive data which shows that children coming from homes below the poverty line have higher rates of obesity to generate an educated guess or a hypothesis as to why these children are more obese than those coming from homes above the poverty line. But you have not proven or tested the hypothesis. You have only generated it from the descriptive data. To test the hypothesis, you need to use analytical studies to answer the why and the how of your hypothesis. In other words, we could conduct an analytical study to determine if health literacy is the reason for obesity in children living below the poverty line, or we could conduct an analytical study to determine whether or not it's access to economic resources needed to buy healthy food that is responsible for children uh, living below the poverty line who are obese. Now, do you see how the two study designs are connected? They follow on from one another in fully answering the question. And once we know what the true underlying reason is for obesity in children, public health programs can be designed to address these issues. If our analytical study found that children living in poverty and their caregivers already know that they should be eating a healthy diet but can't afford it, then public health should focus on programs to redress the economic issue rather than focusing further on health education. This is evidence-based practice, and evidence-based practice makes the best use of our limited resources that we have in public health. So let's begin by talking about descriptive studies, and then we'll move on and talk about analytical studies. Now, as we've already mentioned, descriptive studies answer the who, where, and when in relation to an outcome. In other words, they help us identify the potential independent variables that lead to a dependent variable. From this, we can then generate a hypothesis to explain the relationship between the independent and dependent variables. Once we have gathered descriptive data, oftentimes taken from surveillance records, then we organize it by person, place, and time. And once again, remember that's simply that descriptive epidemiology triad that we've talked about in the past. This is a useful way of organizing the data logically from which we can begin to look for potential relationships. As you can see, person simply refers to demo demographic characteristics such as the age, gender, and so forth of the population being studied. Place simply refers to geography. And finally, time refers to the timing event of the events or the natural history of the disease as it is present in the population that we're studying. Now let's talk about specific types of descriptive studies. Descriptive studies can be characterized by the types of data used in the study. Data at a group level, such as data derived from a city, district, county, or even an entire island, are referred to as aggregate level data. An example of aggregate level data would be the population growth rate for a country. Ecological studies are aggregate descriptive studies, and we'll talk more about what an ecological study is in just a minute.
Now the types of descriptive studies that use individual level data include case reports, case series, and cross-sectional studies, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in a, in a moment as well. Now a case report is a simple summary of the experience of an individual with a particular outcome. Sometimes a single case is so interesting or of such high value that we report on it, such as the first person with a rare disease, such as Ebola. A case series is a summary of a series of individuals with the same outcome. So for example, in 1971, two physicians reported on a series of young women with clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Now this type of cancer was exceedingly rare and generally only occurred in older women. This case series led to an analytical study in which an association between the cancer and DES exposure was explored in depth. Now DES is a type of medication first synthesized in 1938 and oftentimes prescribed to pregnant women. It was not until the 1970s that it was determined that DES was not safe for use in pregnant women owing to the propensity to cause uterine cancer in daughters born to women who had been prescribed the drug. Now this is an example of how a descriptive study led on to an analytical study which fundamentally altered the way in which a medication was prescribed. And we will discuss cross-sectional studies on our next slide. Now a cross-sectional study can be either descriptive or analytical. It depends on the purpose of the study and how it is designed. Now the purpose of the cross-sectional study is to look at a snapshot of the population under study. In other words, it uses prevalence data in which there is no comparison or no control group in which to make a comparison against. Now the population studied consists of all the members of a defined group that have been drawn from the larger population with the idea of being able to produce an estimate of the prevalence of a disease or other phenomena in the larger population. Now it is called a cross-sectional study because it uses a cross-section or a representative sample of the larger population. Now there are several different ways in which we can choose or sample a segment of the population and we'll actually talk about those towards the end of our presentation today. Now we need to talk about when to do a cross-sectional study. Now cross-sectional studies are particularly useful in studying chronic conditions and their risk factors such as smoking leading on to lung cancer and COPD. It is also well suited to study other behaviors that can lead to acute conditions such as the use of seat belts and preventing injuries and automobile accidents. Now remember that because it is a cross-section of the larger population, the idea is that it will tell us something that can be applied to that larger population. For example, recall our example of obesity among school-aged children. If we learn that they have sufficient knowledge about what causes obesity and its impact on health, then we can learn about why this does not translate into better behavior, such as healthy eating choices, among what? A cross-section of obese school-aged children. This data, because it's representative, because it's a cross-sectional set of data, can then be applied to all members of the population regardless of whether they were in the study or not. And this is truly one of the great advantages of the cross-sectional study, is that by studying a smaller segment of the population, we can apply those findings to the larger population as well. So here is another example of a cross-sectional study in action. Here the researchers wanted to estimate the prevalence of violence against women in Mabaya and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. They used a cross-sectional study of the larger population and found that 7% of women in Dar es Salaam and 12% of women in Mabaya experienced violence during the study period. Now this is a descriptive cross-sectional study because it answers the what who, where, and when, but it does not answer the why. To answer the why of violence against women in the study would require an analytical study design, which could be an analytical cross-sectional study. Once again, because it's a cross-sectional study, the smaller sample can be assumed to represent the larger sample. In other words, the findings from this study can represent the larger problem of violence against women in Dar es Salaam and Mabea. And as such, any findings can be applied to prevention programs in this larger population.
But what about applying the findings to violence against women from a study such as this here in the Pacific? Could we apply these findings? It would depend on a number of factors, including similarities between the populations studied in terms of social systems and so on and so forth. If it's found that there's significant social and cultural similarities, then the study findings could actually be applied here in the Pacific. But if there are significant differences, then it would not be easy to apply it. So something to keep in mind when you're out there doing research and looking at literature reviews and you want to apply study findings to your current population. How similar are they? Now we can also undertake descriptive studies to look at new cases of a problem in a population. In other words, incidence database studies. One way of doing this are ecological studies in which new cases of a disease or other phenomena of interest in the population are linked to the level of exposure for the group, not the individual. Now, that probably seems a little confusing at first, so let's go ahead and give an example on the next slide and I think it will become more clear. The important thing to keep in mind is that at least one variable is measured at the group level and not the level of the individual when we're talking about this type of study. So here's an example of an ecological study designed, uh, ecological study design making use of incidence data. What you will notice is that the researchers are looking at the annual death rate for youth aged less than 19 years as taken from, the national, taken from national surveillance data. This is individual level data that is, is extracted from the National Vital Statistics Systems for the years 1968 to 2009. Now, where it becomes an ecological study is that the trends for the group are what is reported based upon age ranges. In other words, individual level data is computed to show large-scale population-based trends. Now, unlike a case report or a case series, we are now looking at population-based data as one of the reported variables. In this instance, the dependent variable of deaths based upon the different age groups. Now, other examples of group level measures include the rates of cancer incidence, the mean level of hypertension, the average sunlight exposure of a specific geographic location, or even preventative services included in a health insurance plan. The occurrence of disease is compared between groups that have different levels of exposure, thus offering a comparison group for this study design. So now that we've talked about descriptive study designs, we're ready to discuss analytical study designs, which include observational and experimental study designs. Now the key difference between descriptive and analytical study designs is that specific exposures are determined that are not available in a descriptive study. Now, descriptive studies are limited to demographic characteristics and some, and some environmental exposure measurements, such as exposure to air pollution, living in a house with asbestos, something like that. Now, because of this, they do not include any information on exposure. Therefore, analytical studies are needed to measure the strength of the association between the independent variable of exposure and the dependent variable of the disease state. And it's in this way that analytical studies answer the why of disease in the target population. In other words, it allows us to test the hypothesis we develop during the analytical stage. When I state that it, that it measures association, I simply mean that it puts a statistical variable, a number, on the association to show its actual strength, such as an odds ratio, a relative risk, a p-value, something along those lines. Now you may recall that we stated you can develop a hypothesis from descriptive studies. A hypothesis, as I'm sure you already know, is simply an educated guess. And we say it's educated because it's based on descriptive data. Now it's an educated guess about an association that can be tested using an analytical study design. Now, a hypothesis tends to be rather broad at first when less is known about exposure and the disease, but it is narrowed and refined as more data is gathered. I think the best thing we could probably do is let's go through some examples to make this just a little bit more clear. 
Now here we see an example of a hypothesis. Um, shisha refers to flavored tobacco that is consumed through passing the tobacco smoke through a vaporizer such as a hookah before inhalation. And it's a common method of consuming tobacco found in MENA, um, M-E-N-A, Middle East and North Africa. Now here we see the independent variable is smoking shisha and the dependent variable is lung cancer. The hypothesis is that those who smoke shisha are more likely to develop lung cancer than those who do not. Now can you think of another hypothesis that might be useful for where you work? How about I give an example while you think of one. Recall our example of obesity among school-aged children. Our hypothesis, based upon descriptive data, was that children who come from homes below the poverty line will have higher rates of obesity. Our exposure would be poverty, and that would be our independent variable, and our outcome would be obesity as our dependent variable. But as we gathered more information, we might refine our exposure and outcome to reflect this. So for example, our exposure might become those with lower levels of health literacy, and our outcome remains obesity or our exposure might become less access to fruits and vegetables as mediated by diet, while the outcome once again remains the same as obesity. Now there are two types of analytical studies that we can use to test our hypotheses, and these are going to be experimental and observational. Now for NCD epidemiology, we will focus on observational studies. In experimental studies, investigators actually assign participants to exposure and control groups, and they can either do this blindly, in other words, the experimenter doesn't know if somebody's assigned to the experimental or the observational group, or they can actually assign them uh, knowing that they've been assigned to either the experimental or observational group. An example of this might be, say we want to test a health education campaign, and so we would assign some groups to the uh, experimental, or some individuals to the experimental side, and they would receive the uh, health education campaign and then we would assign some to the control group in other words they wouldn't receive the educational campaign but let's get back to observational studies because actually most of what we do in epidemiology are going to focus on observational studies. Oh, one quick more mention uh, about experimental studies. I've got their randomized uh, controlled trials. Usually those are going to be seen in drug trials when we're testing the efficacy of a current uh, intervention against a new proposed uh, drug intervention. Okay, so back to observational studies. Now in observational studies, investigators attempt to quantify an exposure that the participants have been exposed to. So for example, if we want to study the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, we don't force people to smoke. We don't take a group of 50 people, lock them in a room and say, you're going to sit here for 10 years, you're going to smoke two packs of camels a day, so I can determine whether or not you get cancer. Okay, that would be unethical. Now, maybe we would like to do things like that as epidemiologists because it would be quicker, but we don't because it's highly unethical. In other words, we don't force people to smoke, but what we do is we go out and we find people that have chosen to smoke. They've intentionally exposed themselves through choice to the independent variable, and we can study those individuals to determine whether or not their choice of exposure to the independent variable ultimately leads to uh, uh, Cancer, for example, is the dependent variable. Now there are going to be three types of observational studies that we can uh, look at. Those are going to be cohort, case control, and cross-sectional. And what we'll do now is we'll just discuss each of those in turn. So let's start with cohort studies. Now a cohort study is designed to show a direct cause-effect relationship between the independent and the dependent variable. Okay. It involves a well-defined group of individuals who share some common characteristic. For example, they might have been born in the same year, have the same gender, live in the same geographic location, have the same exposure of interest such as smoking cigarettes or having been exposed to radiation and so on and so forth, but they all share some type of uh, characteristic that's placed them in the cohort. But the overall idea remains the same. We're going to take a group with some type of similarity and we'll attempt to show that exposure results in a disease state. And what we'll do in the coming slides is we'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by this and how it's going to be applied. 
Now, cohort studies are oftentimes called longitudinal studies or follow-up studies, and they are good for common diseases in which there are enough people in the population with the exposure to risk factors to allow us to study the disease. So, because they need to have diseases that are common in the population or uh, risky behavior that's common in the population, they're going to be very good for studying NCDs because a huge chunk of our population either has NCDs or, more importantly, for our purposes of surveillance has the risk factors for NCDs. Uh, cohort studies are good for showing causation or at least a greater approximation of causation than are the case control studies which will uh, discuss later. And that's one thing I do want you to keep in mind about cohort studies is they're primarily about showing causation whereas case control studies are about showing association. Now I want you to keep in mind that because we're looking at showing an approximation of causation, then we need a large sample size. Now the larger the sample size, the more the sample represents the larger population, and hence bias is less of an issue. Now large and representative sample size plus following the population for a long period of time results in what we call statistical power. And when we have greater statistical power, we have greater applicability of causation to not only the cohort that we've just studied, but more importantly, applicability or generalizability to the larger population as well. And what you'll see in the following sections when we discuss case control study designs, is it, which show only association, is that this is not necessarily going to be the case. Now, cohort studies are used to ensure that the exposure being studied, remember the exposure is simply the independent variable, occurred before the outcome or the dependent variable. In other words, if we're looking at cigarette smoking and lung cancer, that the cigarette smoking occurred before the lung cancer. Logical, right? Now, among observational studies, a cohort study design produces the strongest evidence between exposure and outcome. So, for example, a well-designed cohort study can show that if you smoke enough cigarettes, you have a high probability of developing lung cancer. Cohort studies are good for looking at the effects of rare exposure resulting in outcomes as well. So, for example, a cohort study of all the workers in a nuclear power plant who were exposed to radiation during a core meltdown could show us whether or not those individuals develop testicular cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer at a higher rate than those in the general population. Population. Because it's a rare exposure, we could then follow these individuals for a long period of time to look for the development of that dependent variable. So here we see a diagram that illustrates how a cohort study is set up. Now you start by identifying your study population. Remember your study population is simply your cohort. And then determine who is exposed in your cohort and who is not exposed in your cohort. Now the researcher then follows the cohort forward in time for a period, generally years, to allow exposure to result in the disease state and determines the ultimate disease state of both the exposed and the unexposed exposed groups. Now it's critical that cohort members not have the disease at the beginning of the study because they should be at risk. In other words, they've been exposed to the independent variable, okay, but they don't actually have the dependent variable. They don't have the disease state. Now those with the outcome are excluded from the study. So in other words, if we're once again we're doing cigarette smoking and lung cancer, if I recruit you for a cohort study and you already have lung cancer, then I'm going to exclude you from the study. So in that example I gave, the exposed group should be smokers but should not have lung cancer at the beginning of the study, while the unexposed group should not be smokers and also should not have lung cancer at the beginning of the study. Okay. So ultimately what we're going to do then is we're going to make a comparison between those who have been exposed and those who have not been exposed to assign a numeric estimation of risk between the independent and the dependent variable. Now this will generally be in the form of relative risk, which is a more accurate prediction than the odds ratio, which is associated with case control studies. And because we associate a cohort study with relative risk and because it's a better approximation or a better estimation of risk, that's why we say cohort study designs are causation, whereas case control study designs are association.
Now, for those of you who may wish to conduct a cohort study, and it is possible in your public health agency or your medical practice or in your nursing ward, wherever you happen to be, now you may recall that we discussed in a previous lecture how to compute relative risk. And you probably remember it was pretty simple, okay? But if you're going to do a cohort study design and you're going to go beyond something like relative risk and do a more in-depth analysis like, um, uh, you know, uh, reverse, oh, excuse me, nothing comes to mind. But anyway, if you wanted to do a more in-depth analysis, then you're probably going to need assistance from a statistician. And um, while I'm not officially a statistician, if you do ever decide to do that, I'm more than happy to assist you. And I can also put you in touch with statisticians who are much better than I am. Now there are two types of cohort study designs, okay? There's prospective and there's retrospective. Prospective, like the name suggests, goes forward in time from the point of exposure to the point of follow-up to determine if the disease has occurred. So for example, in 1948 in Framingham, Massachusetts, and you may have heard of this, it's the Framingham Heart Study, um, investigators enrolled over 5,000 men and women in a heart disease study that looked at risk factors for heart disease and ultimately whether or not the participants developed cardiovascular disease. Now the study is actually ongoing and in fact it's on its third generation of participants and illustrates how the study went forward in time and also included a large population over a long period of study. All hallmark characteristics of the cohort study design. And like I said, this is a tenant of prospective studies or the need for a large population that is followed for a lengthy period of time. Now the other type is retrospective, which as the name suggests goes backwards in time to determine whether exposure has occurred in a population in which the outcome of interest is already present in the population. Now retrospective cohort studies are sometimes called historical studies. Now both exposure and disease have occurred in the past. Let me give an example. So for example, health officials in New York City wanted to know if workers with long-term low-level exposure to carbon monoxide were at, at, uh, were at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So they decided to conduct a retrospective cohort study looking at the cause of death for traffic workers who were employed in bridges and tunnels as compared to the general population of New York. And what did they find in their retrospective cohort study? Well, they found that among tunnel workers, there was an increased risk of death from atherosclerosis. Now, retrospective studies actually can be a bit troublesome since it may be difficult to identify when an exposure and a disease actually occurred in the past, but they are quicker and less expensive to conduct since both exposure and disease have already occurred. Because remember, in a prospective cohort study, we enroll these people and we have to wait decades to see whether or not the risk factors they're engaging in in their life actually result in the development of a chronic disease or an NCD. So let's talk now about case control studies. Now case control studies, unlike cohort studies, are not as good at showing a direct cause effect. And as such, they're known as association, not causation studies. This is important to uh, keep in mind there. Now, case control studies simply state that there is some type of an association between the independent and dependent variables and can assign a numeric value to that association using odds ratio. But they do not state that the independent variable has caused the dependent variable. All they're saying is there's some type of an association here. It's also important to note that while cohort studies are good for large populations in which large numbers of individuals have risk factors for the disease, case control studies are generally used in more rare instances, such as exposure to an infectious disease. Now in case control studies, the cases have the outcome of interest. In other words, they have the disease or the dependent variable, whereas the controls do not have the outcome of interest. And the other key difference is that in case control studies, we're usually looking at a smaller population, which results in a quicker and less expensive study. In cohort studies, as you recall, we need a large population, and because we must follow them forward for a period of time, they take longer and tend to be considerably more expensive. 
So here's a diagram that helps illustrate how a case control study is designed. Now you start by identifying your cases from the population that you want to study and then you select appropriate controls from the same population. Then what you do is you collect data on the exposure history to the independent variable from both the cases and the controls. And then you compare exposure between the cases and controls to see if there is a difference. This is another point to keep in mind between case control studies and cohort studies. Whereas most cohort studies are prospective, in other words they're going forward in time, um, and in those instances exposure but the disease has not occurred. In our case control studies we're always looking retrospectively. We're looking backwards for both exposure and possible disease. Now, selecting cases and controls is not always easy. Cases can maybe be difficult to find if the disease under study is rare in the population. Potential sources for cases could include hospitals, clinic, uh, registries, and so on and so forth. Now, for those of you who may wish to conduct a case control study, and they are really quite easy to do in public health, they're cheap, they're quick, and if any of you listening are involved in um, foodborne outbreaks, you've already done case control studies, all right, because that's the typical method we use when we have like an outbreak of a uh, foodborne uh, issue. Uh, for those of you who might be involved in infection control, same thing, case control studies are generally what we do in terms of uh, preventionists or infection control practitioners, okay? So, they're easy to do. Look around you in your department. There's probably people that are already doing these things that could serve as a resource for you. Okay, But if you want to do one of these, and I'd encourage you to do it because it's, it's part of public health practice to generate new knowledge. Now you probably remember that we discussed in a previous lecture okay, that we would use odds ratio for our case control studies. And then once again, if you wanted to do a little bit more in depth, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me and, and I can help you along the lines of uh, uh, further statistical analysis and also put you in touch with other statisticians as well. Oh, we're getting so close to the end. Stick with it. We're almost there, I promise. So in this final section, I want to talk about sampling methods. In other words, how do we go about getting an actual population to study? Now, sampling is a method used to select a specified number of participants in a population for a study. Now, in most cases, we cannot get information on everyone in a population we want to study. It would simply be too expensive, take too much time, and otherwise not be practical to go out and interview everyone in a specific population. That's where sampling comes in. Now, sampling, when done correctly, is an efficient way to get the information that we want and have it hopefully be represented representative of the population that we're studying. Now, a sample should accurately reflect distribution of the relevant variables. So in other words, the independent and the dependent variables in a population according to what? person, place, and time. Now representativeness is essential in order to generalize the findings to the larger population and we've already talked about that. So in most cases we want a representative sample of the population. In other words we want the population that we're studying to be almost a cross-section of the larger population. Okay, But there are what we call non-representative sampling techniques as well. Okay, And these are known as non-probability sampling. And in, in, when we do non-probability sampling, we, we go ahead and we acknowledge that the sample we have is not representative of the larger population. But there are times when non-probability sampling is appropriate. Okay, And we'll talk about that when we get to uh, non-probability uh, non techniques. Now with probability sampling methods, each person has a known chance of being included for the sample. Now sampling methods that use random sampling require that each member of the population has an equal chance of being included in the study. However, there are some situations where a probability sample is not possible because some people have a zero chance of inclusion. Confusing, I know, so let me give an example. Okay. So for example, if we're using social media to conduct a survey, then those who do not have access to the internet or have a Facebook account or something along those lines have what percentage of what percentage chance of inclusion in the study? Well, they have a 0% chance of inclusion in the study. So in non-probability sampling, the probability of inclusion on the study is not known and thus is not representative of the larger population. 
Now, probability sampling is actually quite complex. It's time consuming and it tends to be a little bit more expensive. But with probability sampling, the sample is less likely to be biased and more likely to provide results which can be generalized to the larger population. So in most instances, we want to use probability sampling techniques. So let's start with probability sampling methods, and these are going to include simple random sampling, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling. Now the first method of probability sampling is simple random sampling. With simple random sampling, everyone in the target population has an equal chance of inclusion in the sample. In other words, everyone has a chance of being selected to be part of the study, and everyone's chance of being selected is equal. Now to take a random sample, you simply determine how many people are in the population you are studying. Now this is known as the sampling frame. Let me say that one more time. The sampling frame is simply the number of people in the population that you're studying. Okay? Then you must determine how many members of this target population you want to sample. So in other words, how many people out of the sampling frame do you want to actually study? That is going to be your sample size. Now there are uh, statistical formulas that we can use to determine the appropriate sample size, or there are actually sample size calculators available on the internet that we can use. And if you have the uh, PDF in front of you, I actually list the web address for one of those sample size calculators, or simply just go to Google and type in sample size calculator. Now a sample size calculator allows you to determine how many members of the population you need to sample in order for what? Well, in order for your sample size to be large enough that it's representative of the population. So it is actually quite important that you use a sample size calculator in determining how many people you want to include in your survey or your study or whatever it happens to be. Now, once you've done all that, you're going to assign each member of the sampling frame a number, and use, you're use, just going to use a consecutive numbering sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Then you're going to select units randomly using a process to select the assigned numbers. Okay? And what I recommend is you simply use a random number generator. And if you're confused, hold on, we're going to give an example, and this is all going to become very clear. Okay? Once again, if you've got the PDF in front of you, I um, I have the web address for a random number generator that I like to use there. Or once again, simply go to Google and type in random number generator. So let me give an example so that this all becomes a little bit more clear than uh, muddy water. So for example, let's return to our example of school-aged children with obesity. Let's assume that we have a population of 2,000 students. And if you recall, that's our sampling frame. So we've got 2,000 students in our sampling frame between the ages of 5 to 12, and they're on one of the islands that we work on out there. Okay. Now, we go to our sample size calculator, we plug in the numbers, and it tells us that we need to survey 50 of these children. All right. So now, from our sample frame of 2,000, we have a sample size of 50. So we assign all 2,000 members of the sampling frame a number. In other words, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 2,000. Then we go to our random number generator to randomly generate 50 numbers between 1 and 2,000 and this becomes our random sample. So in other words, what we do then is we have 50 numbers that were randomly generated, and we simply go to our list from our sampling frame, and we match up the numbers from the random number generator to the numbers that were assigned to the members of our, our sampling frame. Okay, You can now see that all members of the sampling frame had an equal chance for inclusion, which is once again the hallmark of the simple random sample. Now, simple random sampling does not require any additional information on the population other than a complete list of the members and their contact information. So, for example, you could use a list of registered vo voters, you could use the employees of a company, you could use students enrolled in a school, and so on and so forth. However, while simple random sampling is easy to apply to small populations, it can actually be difficult to use with large populations because all members of the population must be identified in enumerated, and that's not always easy to do. Now systematic random sampling is similar to simple random sampling in that it also gives every member of the population an equal chance for inclusion. 
okay? But rather than randomly selecting all of the participants individually, a selection interval is determined, a starting point is randomly selected, and participants are selected based upon the selection interval. Okay, once again, confusing words, so let's give an example that it's going to make it much clearer. Okay, so for example, let's look at our school children aged 5 to uh, 15. Okay, and remember we had 2,000 in our sampling frame, and these kids are located on an island somewhere here in the Pacific. So we assign a number to each unit. So once again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 2,000, since we have 2,000 in our sampling frame. Now we calculate the sampling fraction, as it is known, okay, by dividing 2,000 by 50. Now you remember 50 represents our sample size that we had calculated earlier. Okay, so you divide 2,000 by 50 and that gives us 40. Okay, we pick a random starting number between 1 and 40. So I randomly chose 25. And what that means then is that every 40th number thereafter will be our sample size until we reach 50. So we started at 25, okay, we jump ahead 40, that takes us to 65. So the 65th person on our list, they're included in our sample size. We jump ahead a number, another 40, 105. Person that is assigned number 105, they're included in our sample size. And we do that until we have all 50 samples that we want to include in our systematic random sample. So pretty clear cut. Now the stratified random sample is simple and it's easy to use without advanced computer software, but just as with the simple uh, random sample, you do need a complete list of all the members of the population for inclusion, otherwise you can't use this approach. Let's give one more example here. Okay, So here's one more example of how to use a uh, systematic random sample. So we want to calculate the prevalence of tooth decay among 1,200 children attending a school, and we've determined we have a sample size of 100. So what do we do? We list all the children attending the school, and we can actually randomize the list. We would probably take it out of alphabetical order to avoid bias. Okay, Same thing again. Each child is assigned a numeric value 1 to 1,200, and then we get our sampling fraction dividing our 1,200, or sample size by 100, or excuse me, 1200 is our um, sampling frame, by 100, which is our sample size, 12. So we randomly select a number between 1 and 12, and here they've taken 8. And so we select every 12th child starting with child number 8. So 8, 20, 32, 44, etc. So actually very simple, especially when you see it spelled out like that. Now it's a powerful tool, um, systematic random sampling, and it's one that's easy to use. So now let's talk about stratified random samples. Now with this method, random samples are selected from within homogeneous subgroups, which are called strata. Okay. Now to take a stratified random sample, you need to list all the units in the population. Then the population is going to be divided into these subgroups known as strata based upon at least one common characteristic. So let's give an example here. Okay, so you may choose to stratify your sample by ethnicity so that you can get equal representation of different ethnic groups in your sample. Now a number is assigned to each unit within each strata, and here maybe the ethnicity is based, or excuse me, the strata is based upon ethnicity. So a number is assigned to each unit within each strata, and then a random sample is selected from each stratum. Okay. Finally, you're going to combine the random samples within each stratum to form the full sample. So each member of the particular stratum has an equal chance of being selected. However, the probability of selection might actually be different between the strata depending upon their sizes. And So here we see an example that's going to make this just a little bit clearer. Okay, so here we see an example of the stratified random sample where the stratum are divided by gender, which shows how the chances of inclusion in each strata are equal within the strata, okay, but differ across strata based upon the population size. So in other words, here we see we have more men than women, and so there's a there's a difference in terms of probability of being included in the uh, sample size based upon the size of the strata. Now when data are stratified, the selection process is similar to simple random sampling in that all the units are listed and numbered and then randomly selected. Now an advantage of stratified random sampling is that the investigators can ensure that small subgroups are actually included in the study.
So let me give an example. So for example, in a uh, survey of taxi cab drivers, and actually depending upon the island you're, you're on here in the Pacific, there are actually a lot of taxi cabs. Um, we use, we use them a lot here in Pompeii in the uh, southern Pacific. They're very common in Fiji, and we actually rely on them, on them he heavily. Now, if we were to do a simple random sampling of taxi cab drivers, what we might do is we might actually miss out on the very small number of women drivers that are present in the population. But by stratifying the sample frame into males and females, the investigators would ensure that they include women drivers in their survey and not just male drivers. So you can see it's a a very powerful tool for ensuring appropriate representation of small strata which might otherwise be missed. Now stratified sampling is a uh, commonly used probability method. Like I said, each stratum is assured equal representation in the sample. And as a result, stratified sampling is used when one or more strata in a population are small and as such might not be represented using simple random sampling techniques. Now because the members of each strata are more similar than different, there is less variability and hence the overall sample is more representative of the larger population and thus our statistical uh, data is more likely to be able to be applied across the larger population as well. Now here are some great examples of strata that can be used to sample uh, uh, that we can use to sample using the stratified random sampling technique. So you see we could break things down by race or ethnicity, age group, gender, geographic location, um, socioeconomic status, and so forth. All of those are examples of strata, or in other words, small subgroups of individual that we, individuals that we might find within the larger population. Now remember that this is not an exhaustive list, and there are many different ways in which a sample can be stratified based upon your particular area and the needs of the study you're conducting. Finally, we will talk about cluster sampling as our last representative sampling technique. Now in cluster sampling, the population to be studied is divided into natural geographically diverse groups known as clusters. Okay? And this could be based upon everyone attending a particular school, everyone living in a specific village, everyone in a specific workplace or at a specific campus, something like that. Now each cluster is assigned a number and then a sample of clusters is randomly selected. Now once the clusters are selected, all units within the selected cluster are included in the sample. And when we include all the units within the selected cluster, that's called one stage cluster sampling. Or we can take a random sample of all the units within the selected cluster, and that would be called two stage cluster sampling. Okay. And this is actually a commonly used technique as well. Um, it's commonly used by WHO when they look at immunization rates. And it's also the type of approach we use for rapid assessment of a population following a disaster. Oops. Now there are many advantages to cluster sampling, with the most obvious being that if you're doing face-to-face -face surveys for a large geographic area, this makes sampling much easier in terms of time and money constraints. There are some disadvantages though, including loss of correlation within the clusters, meaning that they may not actually be representative of the larger population if they were, to if they were not totally surveyed. Okay. As such, it may be necessary to increase the sample size to ensure that it is uh, representative of the larger population. Now we're going to talk briefly about non-probability sampling. Now this is any type of sampling technique where the chances of inclusion for each person is unknown and may actually be zero depending upon the sampling technique. Just as an example of that, what if we're using mobile phones to contact individuals in terms of a survey? Okay. Well, we know that not everybody in the population has a mobile phone or they may have a mobile phone that's not functioning or as commonly seen among many populations, they don't have any time on the phone, all right? So we can't reach those individuals. So in other words, those individuals have a zero probability of being included in our sample. Now non-probability sampling is easy and cheap, okay, but it's not representative of the larger population. As such, you cannot apply your results to the larger population. 
That's a limitation of your study. And it's okay if studies have limitations. We just simply have to acknowledge it's a limitation of our study up front. Okay? Now, in addition to it not being representative, the results actually may be biased due to the selection of participants whose views on a health condition are well outside the normal range for the population. Now, convenience sampling, which is our first type, refers to selecting those units which are readily available. For example, a survey of teenage girls aged 15 to 19 on their understanding of the HPV vaccine based upon the first 50 females who meet the definition and happen to be present in a public place would be convenience sampling. So maybe we go down to the market and we simply say, well, I need to survey 50 15 to 19 year old females and I'll sit here and the first 50 15 to 19 year old females that come along, that's who I'll include in my survey. And I do it because it's convenient. It is whoever happens to be there. Or I might spend the day sitting in the clinic with a survey on disability and I simply say, um, the first 25 people that come in today that have an amputation, I'm going to interview them because it's convenient for me to sit here and wait for these individuals. Now, snowballing refers to a technique whereby an existing member of the sample recruits the next member. Now, this is commonly used in HIV research where candidates can be difficult to identify. So, for example, looking at attitudes towards sharing needles among HIV patients, the recruiter has identified three HIV positive candidates and asks each of them to identify two more candidates and so on and so forth. And in this way, it's actually similar to the concept of exponential growth, but once again, it's not representative of the larger sample and in, in many ways it's just simply another form of convenience sampling. And finally we have what is known as voluntary sampling. Now voluntary sampling refers to individuals who choose to participate in a study. So for example a public health department may advertise that they need individuals to complete a survey about breastfeeding by mothers who have given birth in the past 12 months. Now those who choose to come forward and participate are self-selecting themselves. Now voluntary, uh, voluntary sampling is heavily biased because those who participate oftentimes have a special interest in the study. Well, once again, you've done it. You've made it through. Um, congratulations, and I do hope that you've learned something today. Now, as always, I want to thank um, our sponsors for supporting these lectures, but most of all, I want to thank you for your hard work and dedication. Um, you're all very busy people, but you've chosen to take time away to improve yourselves in regarding to improve yourselves in regarding to uh, your knowledge of epidemiology, and I just want to say well done for that. I also want to ask that if you've been given time away from your job to complete these video lectures, special access to YouTube, whatever the case may be, please go and thank your supervisors for their support on uh, your behalf and my behalf as well. Now as always to uh, complete your participation send me an email with your three learning points and then get ready for lecture number five which is entitled Analysis and Interpretation of Surveillance Data and that will be released next month. As always thank you very much and have a wonderful wonderful day.